God has responded to our prayers, saying it is now possession season. All creation is waiting for a prophetic generation. It's unbreakable, unshakable. It's possessable for those that dare to believe. I prophesy the greatest miracles are going to happen in the next season. This season is going to see a transforming of our people. It's time to set your foot, say it loud, and shoot it straight. Hi, welcome. I'm Steve Penny, and this is Say It Loud. These are important days, and I think the Christian church needs to be able to speak boldly and directly and say it loud as to what the Word of the Lord is concerning the times and the seasons in which we find ourselves. And so I want to preach my second in a series on Jerusalem. As you know, this is October 2023, and uh, a war has broken out down in the Gaza Strip and uh, an, an invasion into Israel by Hamas. And uh, it's triggered off an incredible conflict with high casualties and hostages and all kinds of brutality, etc. And Israel is responding to that right now in, in the days in which we're watching it unfold. They're fighting for their existence and their future in that region. And so um, someone said to me, pray for Israel. I said, of course we will. And then God began to speak to me about, it actually says in Psalms that we talked on last, we pray for the peace of Jerusalem. We talked about why that's so important out of uh, Mount Zion, the, the, the walled city within the city of Jerusalem on the Temple Mount is where the law of the Lord would run forth to the nations and bring peace. And so we're praying for that to be established again uh, and for Israel to, to find the Prince of Peace, to turn to the Lord in such difficult days. But I want to change tack a little and learn from this and apply it to us. And I want to ask the question today, where is your Jerusalem? Where is your Jerusalem? And I want you to come with me to probably in the Bible, Israel's finest hour in history. And it's in 1 Kings chapter 3 and verse 15. Solomon as a young leader, David's son has just been promoted to be king over Israel and uh, he's praying and asking God for wisdom. And uh, God, I, I, it's not really about riches and fame for me. It's about your wisdom so I can rule properly and so that you can be the God of Israel. And so God re responds to Solomon and uh, promises Solomon a glorious kingdom and an incredibly blessed life as well. And so it's interesting to see what then Solomon does to this promise from God of an incredible kingdom and a glorious royal lineage, whatever. And it says this, in 1 Kings 3.15, it says, Then Solomon awoke. He woke up and indeed it had been a dream. The whole thing was a dream. And he came this is then what he did based on that dream of God revealing himself to Solomon. It says, And he came to Jerusalem and stood before the ark of the covenant of the Lord and offered up burnt offerings and offered up peace offerings and made a feast for all his servants. And so I want to ask you a big question today, focusing on where, where's your Jerusalem what does that look like in your life? Here's my question. Is Christianity really just a dream? You know, the promised land and all the wealth, health and happiness and all that, we know that that doesn't seem to be the lot of too many people in life, in the real world. And so uh, he was promised, Solomon was pro promised wisdom, wealth, and wholeness or prospering wholeness, salvation, complete wholeness. And he was, he was promised the lot. You couldn't win anything better than this. And so we need to go back and see 
what God said to him before he made this promise. And this is so important. 1 Kings 3, verse 12 to 14, the two verses, three verses before verse 15 that we read a moment ago says this. In answer to Solomon's request, God said, Behold, I have done according to your words. See, I have given you a wise and understanding heart. So there has not been anyone like you before, nor shall any like you arise after you. And I've also given you what you have not asked for. I've given you both riches and honour, so that there are so that there shall not be anyone like you among the kings all the days of your life. And so, if you walk in my ways to keep my statutes and my commandments as your father David walked, then I will lengthen your days of ruling and rejoicing in my goodness. What an incredible promise from God. Solomon started off so well, asking for the right things, And uh, so it was like he was dreaming when God said, I've given you all this. And he woke up and said, was that just a dream or was that a reality? And I love the passage here because it tells us how to make a dream become a reality. These are the decisions that Solomon made based on this phenomenal dream of a great future, good success and everything else that we're all promised in those prophecies we get, everything else, the dreams, dreams are shaped by your decisions. And so here we go. Here are the decisions Solomon made to bring his dreams to pass. The first one is he went and gathered in Jerusalem. He could have run around sprouting this off. No, he went back into the city of God the place of God's presence and His Word. He returned to the place of God's presence and the place of God's Word. And if you want to see your dreams come to pass, you have to be the believer. You have to be the church where God's presence is real. You run back to that. Whenever you get a big idea or a great dream or someone prophesies, run back to the presence and get into the Word and let it be revealed to your heart there because it's that decision that determines everything about your dream of being the great leader over the greatest city, Jerusalem on planet earth. He made the right decision. That's your first one. Where's your Jerusalem? Where do you gather? Are you infrequent? You got all these big ideas, but you don't run to the Jerusalem presence, power and precept of God to affirm it and confirm it and establish it in the will of the Lord. I'm amazed at Christians that treat church so lightly. It's like it's a a golf club or a casino. You come in for your lucky strike or you come in whenever you feel like it, when the urge takes you. No, no, this guy's just had a dream that's earth shattering. You're going to rule over the greatest city on planet Earth, and you're going to have royalty and gold and like no one's ever seen before. You'll have whatever. What does he do? He runs back to church. Said, God, confirm it in the midst of the brethren, in your presence. Let your word be under me, a surety that that which I've dreamt is clearly of the Lord Most High. So these are difficult days. And it's everything we do to preach, hey, keep your dream alive. No, you keep it alive in the presence of God, in the Word of God. That's where you keep your dreams alive and healthy and focused and obedient to God. You keep them alive in your Jerusalem. Where is your Jerusalem today? That's a great challenge. Second thing he did, second decision he made, And I love these. He's got the biggest dream of anyone I've ever heard of in my life. But he's he's doing all the right things. He's making the... Find your Jerusalem. Run to your Jerusalem. Make it your first priority in life. Not your dream, your Jerusalem. 
Make that your first priority and your dreams will start to come into focus. Second thing he does is stand before the presence of God. Stand before the presence of God. Now I'm too busy with my dream. Take that much time. I haven't got time to, I got to start work real early because I'm, you know, I got big dreams and I'm, I'm doing pretty well. I haven't got time to be in the, the prayer meeting, in the presence of God. I probably could if I wanted to, but I'm just focused on my dreams. You got to stand before the presence of God. One of the big things that if you've been in leadership and ministry for God, you learn this uh, one way or another, and you can learn it easy or you learn it hard. You got to learn to come and stand in the presence of God. Be still and know that I am God. You got to learn to stand in the presence of God and just stand in humility, wait on God. It's the hardest thing for this ego man, this human drive of human success and overcoming and being something. Hardest thing is to come and stand before the presence of God. I try my best every morning to get up real early between 3 and 4 a.m. That's my body function now. And so it's a habit that responds to my spiritual habit. And so I get up and I begin to come into the presence of God. But it's so easy to have seasons where you just go dull. You're, do, you're doing all the right habits but it's like you're not stopping. Your mind is racing. You're checking social media. You're planning the week over here when you should be standing in the presence of God. And uh, one of the things you've got to learn is that when you wait on Him, standing God's presence, He lifts you up. He lifts you up. He exalts you. Humble yourself under the mighty hand of God and in due time, He'll lift you up. You've got to learn to stand in God's presence. I've never seen such a frenetically busy generation. Not only the young kids running around seeking every, you know, uh, high they can find, but even the older Christians running around trying to chase after their dreams when God said, no, no, I'm the dream maker. I bring it to pass. You've got to learn to find your Jerusalem, my presence, and then you have to then learn to stand, be still, practice waiting on God until. And so when I, and I haven't done this for a while, I feel God stirring me. When I start to go flat in my devotional, waiting on God in the morning, and I'm distracted, and I just know it's not fresh, I have to then, for me, set aside a, a couple of days or so and go press into God and stand in His presence, no agenda, until. If you don't know what that until is, you probably have never done it. And uh, there's just an until that happens. I, you can spend time in God's presence and you meet with Him until. And something changes. May not be the greatest earth chattering. You know, he hasn't told you every prophecy from now to Christmas. Right? But there's an until moment. You come out of there knowing you're different. And I, over the years of praying and fasting and standing before God, I've been amazed how often I go to church the next weekend and people say, what have you been up to? There's something different about you. I, I wouldn't have said there was anything different, but the until happened. And God just freshened, revived, restored, refreshed something in me. And people can smell the fragrance of heaven. They also know the smell of sweat. There's no sweat in God's presence. That's why he says stand. He doesn't say run around and manifest and do all. He says stand in my presence. And the, stand before the presence if ever there's a day 
in which we need to learn this, it's this day. The world is agitating and doing all kinds of, you know, high maneuvers and all kinds of posturing. No, no, stand. Having done all, stand in the presence of God and wait on God until it'll change your life. I challenge those that are watching, book yourself out for a couple of days. Go wait on God. No agenda, no program, just you standing. Don't even try and pray the whole time and tell God who you are and what you are. Stand. The Holy Spirit will start. It'll, it'll start to come clear and He'll start to talk to your heart. The third thing that Solomon did here, these are the decisions that were going to bring his dream of a great Jerusalem, a great nation, a great leadership, a prospered person into reality. His third decision is he's going to, in the presence of God, offer up burnt offerings, sin offerings. And this is simply, if you want to live in the blessing and favour of God, you've got to learn to live in cleansing and forgiveness. Father, forgive me, cleanse me. There, there, I'm not a sinner, I'm a saint. But I'm a saint that may not always practise righteousness the best way. And so I come daily and say, Father, cleanse me, wash me again, restore me in righteousness into the favour and blessing position that you have prepared for me. So you've got to learn to offer up. Pride doesn't do that. Ego won't do that. It hates saying sorry to anyone, including God. Live in cleansing and forgiveness. 1 John 9 verse 10, this verse, it's one of my favourites. And it's not written to sinners, it's written to saints. It says this, If we confess our sins, He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. We just didn't do it best we could or we slipped up, whatever. But it, and it goes on and says, If we say that we have not sinned as Christian, we make Him a liar and His Word is not in us. So I choose, I've made a decision to live in forgiveness and cleansing on a daily basis, that I can walk in confidence before the Lord. The next thing it says, I love this. These simple decisions on how to live in the favour, the, the dream life that God promises to every believer. And the next one it says, offer up peace offerings. Offer up peace offerings. They're different. They often go together. Sin offering and the peace offering. Offer up peace offerings. Come before God and pray for the peace of your family. Nothing's worse than division, being divided, having conflict. Pray for the peace of your Jerusalem, your church, your life, your world of influence. Pray for the peace of your city. Offer up peace offerings. And then forgive and pray for your enemies, those that attack you, despitefully use you and mistreat you. You be the bigger person, the person of honour, and show love and forgive them. Pray for the peace and forgiveness for your enemies. You'll be amazed how God lets you live the royal life, the, the favoured city, the kingdom reigning life, if you'll make the right decisions and not be driven by your dreams and dominated by your dreams, but understand it's God who works in you, both to will and to do of His good pleasure. He's doing a good job if you let Him. And then the last one it says of Solomon in this first uh, verse 15 that we read out together, Solomon then says he's dealt with his own stuff and he feels good and free and God's going to, fulfill his promises. And then he says, now make a feast for all my servants and all the people under him. And make the, no wonder they loved him as a king. No wonder the city flourished. No wonder his family lived in the goodness of God until he later, and he started to forget this stuff and get a big head and backslide. But he make a feast for all the people. Celebrate the goodness of God. Learn to encourage people 
in the land of the living. Help them celebrate every good success they have. God will sort out their motives. You just help celebrate and live a positive and joyful life. I love that. Solomon was good at throwing parties. He, he was known for the great celebrations, etc., uh, of royalty, and they'd come from a long way off because he, he would wine and dine them at excellence level. Nobody had threw a party. Well, that's what God wants for you. He wants you to see your dreams come to, be, to reality because you made the right decisions. And as they come to reality, don't ever forget your servants. Don't ever forget the people in your world and throw, celebrate with them, throw feasts with them and help them celebrate the goodness of God in the land of the living and see joy, love, joy, peace come to pass in all of their lives. This is a simple word and I link it back to Jerusalem because, and the question is, where's your Jerusalem? What do you run to when you get a good idea? Who do you run to? When you get a prophecy, uh, what, what motivates your heart when things start to go your way? Or is your dream now becoming your taskmaster, your God, because you start to taste the fruits of the dream coming to success and that'll be quickly over if you don't understand that it's the King of glory who's the dream fulfiller, the dream maker. And make the right decisions. Your decisions determine the outcome of the best of your dreams, the greatest of your prophecies, your decisions. Doing it godly, living for God. And I come back to the simple question, where's your Jerusalem? How's your church life going? Is it the run to? God, I, I've had an incredible week. It's been amazing. I've got to come and bring praise and, you know, a great offering to you today. You have done great things. I know where to run to. My Jerusalem is very important. Let me pray for you. I feel God talking to people about daring to believe those dreams can come to pass if you'll put God first. Father, today, I love the people of Israel. I love the city of God, the Jerusalem, the, the Temple Mount, the Mount of the Lord. I love all that stuff. But when we break it down, it's us now living as your people. And we need our Jerusalem strong. Our God factor strong. Seek first the kingdom of God, the God presence, the God word in my life. And if I'll do like Solomon did, his meteoric rise to fame and fortune, significant authority and victory was unprecedented because you were with him. He knew how to stand in your presence. I pray you'll bless every person listening today. May they arise and run to your presence with every dream of their heart, every aspiration of their soul, that they might hear you afresh and follow in all your ways in the blessing of the Lord. Everyone said, Amen. Hey, listen, if you're not right with God, make one decision. Give your life to the Son of God, Jesus, the Saviour of the whole world. One decision and every dream that's in your heart may well start to take shape from then on in your life in Jesus' name. Hey, God bless you. Look forward to talking more about Jerusalem and its importance in our lives as we drill into this next week together. God love you. God bless you.